Jesus um, was moved with compassion on the crowds. The people came to hear him speak. He's on the hillside there overlooking the Sea of Galilee. And they've been listening all day long and they're fainting <laughs> from hunger and they're scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, he opened his mouth and said, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. That's not the usual way we handle things, isn't it? Uh, I thought it was an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and a hand for a hand and a foot for a foot. And it goes, oh, there's quite a list of things there. Moses recorded that. And of course, Jesus said, you've heard it said of old, and eye for an eye, but I say unto you, love your enemies. Resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite you on the right cheek, turn to him the other. If a man take away your coat, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, Go with him too. Go the extra mile, we call that. Do you have any enemies? Love them, bless them, do good to them. Pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. Why? So that you may be the children of your Father, which is in heaven, for he makes his son to rise on the evil and the good, sends rain on everyone, just and unjust. He is no respecter of persons. He treats everybody the same. Does our father and his son have enemies? Psalm 2, the second psalm begins with a question. How has the heathen raged against the Lord and his anointed? Who's that? The Father and the Son. <laughs> the Lord and the Messiah, the anointed one. The one christened with the Spirit of God. Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor and set at liberty those that are bound. When tares showed up in the field of uh, freshly planted grain, Jesus said, an enemy has done this. And um, what's the last enemy? Death. That's the last one. Well, who's the first enemy? Him that has power over death, that is the devil. Um, Jesus said he's a liar. The father of lies. A murderer from the beginning. He wanted to murder. And finally, he did. But Jesus said, you know, you've heard it said of old, thou shalt not kill. But I tell you, if you hate your brother, murder began with hate. And um, there is somebody in the way of climbing the ladder of success, Lucifer had to get rid of. <laughs> he wanted to be top dog. And there was someone in, in the way. But Jesus said, love your enemies. We're told that God bore long with Lucifer. We don't know how long. My, in eternity, that could be a long time compared to our frame of mind, our time uh, sense of time and duration. Love suffers long, 
and is kind. Love seeks not her own, is not easily provoked, thinks no evil, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Sounds like a description of God, doesn't it? Well, that makes sense. God is love, so he should be all these things. And it was demonstrated. He demonstrated this love and how he treated many people. I can't help but think of Judas. Jesus demonstrated this, bore along with Judas, even washed his feet. Jesus never exposed Judas. Right up to the end, the disciples thought Judas was going on an errand for Jesus when he left the upper room supper that night. A thief and profiteer, though he was. Jesus was so kind to his betrayer. When Judas came in the garden with the mob, Jesus addressed him, friend. He did not resist the rough treatment he received. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he didn't threaten. <coughs> Peter threatened the neck of one in the mob with a sword, swung at his head and got an ear. Jesus stopped his zealous disciple, repaired the damage. The life of Jesus was also manifested in the mortal flesh of others in the Bible record. Joseph, boy, lots of parallels there with Joseph. He endured the hate of his brothers, the treachery of Potiphar's wife, and unjust incarceration for years, and thoughtless neglect of the exonerated butler who forgot about him, all without any report or complaint or resentment. Instead of punishing his ill-deserving brothers when they unwittingly came to him for food, two years into the famine, he showed inexplicable favor on them. Their money in their sacks of grain, his silver goblet. <laughs> How in the world did they get that? Well, he had it planted there, of course. Gave him all kinds of extra things. Treated him to a banquet, finally. Arranged them all in order of age. <laughs> He's dropping so many hints, and they didn't catch on. He harbored no grudge when at last he revealed his true identity, but rejoiced that God had allowed all that happened to him for their good. God has done all of this that you might be saved. <laughs> and he saved a lot of other people, too. In many ways, Joseph was a savior to the world at that time. Seven years of plenty, and they wisely stored it up for the seven years of drought that were coming, and he knew that, and famine would come. Moses, also a type of Christ, the meekest man who ever lived, written about himself. Oh, he at first thought that brute force was needed, and he put one notch on his belt, <laughs> got one Egyptian. Then he learned patience and meekness for 40 years in the wilderness of Midian, taking care of sheep, learned how to be a shepherd like Jesus, the good shepherd. Patient under murmuring and criticism by the people who were almost ready to stone him, he said, 
because they didn't have any water at Rephidim, after Rephidim, and he got up on the rock there and was commanded to strike the rock. And water came gushing out. Now there must have been a lot of water because if you consider over a million, million and a half maybe people and all of their animals, and that might have been just the adults, the men, uh, all the livestock, that's a lot of water they need. Moses was once a prince in Egypt, led the people out of bondage into the promised land. Just as Jesus is the prince of peace, and he's going to lead his people out of the bondage of sin into his father's kingdom. Moses was 40 days in Mount Sinai receiving the law. Jesus was 40 days in the wilderness, and then he magnified the law and the Sermon on the Mount, made it wonderful. Then there is Elisha. I like this story. Elisha is parallels uh, Jesus in a way that Elijah, of course, parallels John the Baptist. Elijah and John the Baptist uh, had similar personality traits, I think, you might say. Uh, both were fearless. Elijah marches right into Ahab's court. No rain for you for three and a half years. <laughs> uh, John the Baptist tells the Roman soldiers in the crowd, and the, oh, worse, the Jewish leaders, you generation of vipers, what are you doing here? <laughs> And Herod, yeah, you are sinning with your brother's wife. And of course, Herodias didn't like that. Got him put in, the, in jail. Ultimately got his head. Elijah had a death threat from a woman on his head too, didn't he? He could run for his life. John the Baptist couldn't. But John the Baptist was a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. And uh, Jesus, whom he said is going to come after him, will baptize you with fire, the spirit and the fire. And yet Elijah was the one who had fire. <laughs> There's some things that don't quite fit exactly right. But Elisha, now, Elisha is different than Elijah. He's a different demeanor, different character, different personality, and in a lot of ways fits better with Jesus following John the Baptist as Elisha fell, followed Elijah. In 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 17, it's... Uh, message that comes to Elijah when he's up there on Mount Horeb. You remember he's run for 40 days for his life. He's at the cave and uh, what are you doing here Elijah? Come out here. I want to talk to you. Let me show you something. There was a terrible wind. The wind was so strong it rent the rocks it says. Now, that's Hurricane? Tornado? Maybe it was uh, F5, F6, F7. <laughs> it was way up there on the scale. And it just ripped those rocks right off the mountain. But, 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 but the Lord wasn't in the wind. And then there was an earthquake. Boy, it it, the rocks that weren't blown off the mountain now were shook off the mountain. And it was a rolling, horrible earthquake. But the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And then there was fire. Elijah 
He knew about fire. Fire came down out of heaven, didn't it? Fire again. And the Lord wasn't in the fire. And then there was a still, small voice. And he gave him some instruction. He says, it shall come to pass that him that escapes, oh, first of all, he wants him to go and anoint Hazael, uh, king of Damascus, and, uh, or Jehu, Jehu, king of northern kingdom. And Hazael was somebody else. He anointed him too. Hazael and he, and Elisha, there's three. And Elisha uh, is to be anointed as prophet in your stead. And then it says, this, this is the part that I wanted to quote here. This is verse 17. Whoever escapes the sword of Hazael shall Eli Jehu slay. And him that escapes the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Now, we know what Jehu did. I don't know too much about Hazael, what, how many people he slayed. But Jehu was instrumental in the ultimate demise of Jezebel. She didn't get slain with a sword. She got thrown out the second story window and the dogs ate her up, except for her hands, yeah, palms and soles. I think the only thing left. They didn't eat. But I can't find anywhere where Elisha slayed anyone with a sword. Do we know of any one that Elisha? I, I don't know of any. But he practiced the teachings of Jesus. And this is what we want to look at. Manifesting the life of the meek and lowly one. When the Syrians surrounded the city of Dothan, you remember uh, his servant woke up that morning, looked out there, and oh, man. Now, wh why were they being surrounded? Well, the king of Syria wanted to send down and uh, invade and Maraud, marauding groups come down there and terrorize the uh, Israelites in, in the northern kingdom. And before they got down there, every time his troop movements would show up at a certain place, the king of Israel was there waiting for him. Well, Elisha was told what was going to happen, and he sent word to the king, and they were ready every time they came down. And king of Syria said, I've had it. There's, what, what is going on here? And so one of his uh, people said, well, you know, they've got a prophet down there, and he knows what you're whispering in your bedchamber. <laughs> he knows all about you and everything you're going to do. Well, we'll take care of that. <laughs> Where is he? Yeah, they... So the mole tell you, they find out, and uh, he's in Dothan. So they wake up that morning, and they look out, uh, the servant looks out, and he sees all these Syrian chariots and the horsemen and, uh, all around the city. They're surrounded. Oh, man, he's just really upset. What are we going to do? And Elisha just prays a prayer. He says, Lord, open his eyes. For those who are with us are greater than those that are with them. <laughs> and suddenly he can see all the chariots of the Lord all surrounding the hills behind the Assyrians. They're surrounded. <laughs> and they come into the city and they're going to take, the, take Elisha. And they finally come to, they find out where he's at. They come down there and they knock on the door. Elisha comes to the door, but as he does, they're blinded. They can't find the door. Oh, they they're searching around, bumping into everybody. And he says, who are you looking for? Elisha, the man of God. 
Well, let me take you. I can take you where you need to go. And he leads them to the king of Israel in Damascus, to the king's palace. All these soldiers are blind, they can't see anything. He gets them up there. And uh, the, Syria, the king of, uh, of Israel says, Oh, good, our enemies, we got them surrounded. Oh, this is wonderful. Good job, Elisha. <laughs> and Elisha prays again, and their eyes are opened, and they can see. And the king says to Elisha, Shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? This is uh, 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 21. What an opportunity. You got your enemies, they're all right there in your, own, in your hands. It's just like the last story we heard. And what did Oded say? Bringing all these captives in. Same thing that Elisha says. Well, look at this. In uh, verse 22, Elisha answered, Thou shalt not smite them. Rather, set bread and water before them, that they may eat and drink and go to their master. Let them go back home. Take good care of them. Elisha is a type of Christ demonstrated the new commandment. Love one another. Love your enemies. 1 John chapter 2, I write no new commandment, but an old one which you heard from the beginning. And in Romans chapter 12, verses 19, 20, 21, Paul says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he thirst, give him to drink. For in doing so, you shall reap, heap coals of fire upon his head. Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Even in the time of Jesus, uh, we know of uh, one uh, case where the temptation was to respond to the enemies. And to, you know, Peter did that with the sword, but uh, James and John, they came to Jesus one day after the Samaritans wouldn't allow them to stay in their city because he had his face set as if he was going to Jerusalem. And they said, come on, we want you to stay here. I've, I've got to get to Jerusalem. And well, if you're not going to stick around and talk with us, then we're not going to take care of you. And James and John said, isn't there a good opportunity to teach them a lesson? Ungrateful Samaritans. Elijah, hmm, I remember he called down fire, burned up captains of 50, twice. Captains and his 50, that'd be 50, 102 people he burned up with fire. Came right out of heaven, burned them up. Just say the word and let us command fire to come down and burn up these Samaritans. And Jesus said, You can't smite them. You can't smite them. <laughs> you don't know what spirit you are of. The Son of Man is not come to destroy, but to save. You know what happened uh, when the king of Israel fed and uh, took care of those Syrian captive soldiers and let them go back home. 2 Kings 6, 23, it says, So the bands of Syria came no more into the land of Israel. At least for a while. <laughs> Maybe while 
Elisha was around. Were the Samaritans the enemies of Jesus? Did they conspire to kill him like his own people? It was, after all, a Samaritan woman through whom Jesus reached the entire city of Sychar. It was a Samaritan leper, the only one of the ten who came back to thank him. It was a Samaritan who had compassion on a battered victim on the road to Jericho. Jesus taught of a father who loves his enemies forever and blesses those who curse him forever, does good to those who hate him forever, and prays for those who despitefully use and persecute him forever. But if they depart and turn their back on his offer to accept and give them the life they need, they will be left without life. They will be separated from the source of life. It is not what God does to his enemies that will secure allegiance and loyalty to him forever. It is what he allowed his enemies to do to him and his son, that through death he might destroy him who has power over death, that is, the devil. This is from the Mount of Blessings. You've probably read it all now. <laughs> if you are the children of God, you are partakers of his nature, and you cannot but be like him. Partakers of his spirit, the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you. Every child lives by the life of his father. If you are God's children, begotten by his spirit, you live by the life of God. In Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Because the fullness of the Father is in him. That's what Jesus said. It is the Father that dwells in me. He does the works. And it gives me the words to speak. And the life of Jesus is made manifest in our mortal flesh. We sang that yesterday. And the life of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. 2 Corinthians 4, 1, 1. Because Jesus was manifest in the flesh. John 1, 1. One four. That life in you will produce the same character and manifest the same works as it did in him. Thus, you will be in harmony. You will be one with every precept of his law. Amount of blessings. Well, that's quite a statement there. Isn't that neat? It pretty well says it, doesn't it, John? <laughs> We've been talking about this all week here. This is a good one. I like it. Well, I thought this would be really great on the heels of the story of Oded, <laughs> the story of Elisha. He fed him. He gave him water. Sent him back home. And Jesus says, that's the way you treat everyone, enemy or not. And they might become your friends as these soldiers, they didn't come back and bother them again. They were treated well. Father, we thank you for the best representation of your love, your life, in the life and the words of your son, his teaching, your words, the way you treat people is the way he treated us and others. May we learn from his example and those that you have shown in the Bible how they also learned to follow your way, your life, your way of thinking. Change our 
thought patterns, our way of responding, and make us more like Jesus every day is our prayer in his name. Amen.